Okay, well, I'll make a start anyway. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to echo uh, Luke's uh, welcome to everybody here today. And uh, what I wanted to say was just a little bit to explain what the, the European Megalithic Studies Group is, you can see the title, and um, to explain uh, how it's developed and uh, to, to talk also about what we've done in the past and to introduce, to, to lead, lead us up to today's uh, meeting. So first of all, it's uh, an informal group, it's inclusive, it doesn't have a fixed membership, uh, it doesn't have a, a particular list of members, but it's intended for all those who are interested in early monumentality along the western and northern margins of Europe. Now the term megalithic, in European megalithic studies, the term megalithic is convenient, but it's also somewhat problematic because it strictly applies only to monuments constructed of what we might call extravagantly large stones. In fact, I... yeah. Um, so, the, the, the megalithic element, nonetheless, is very important, I think, and we shouldn't lose sight of it. Um, the, the use of megalithic, of course, goes back now 150 years or more, and um, this use of what has been called extravagantly large stones is clearly a key feature of many of these monuments that we're talking about. But it's more than just a feature in itself, because I think it relates to a set of particular significance or significances attaching to large stone blocks or to the sources from which they were derived, be that um, cliffs or outcrops or boulder fields. The materiality of the stone is very important. At the same time, uh, let me see, let me see where I'm getting to. I think, yes, I'm afraid I've got this slightly out of order. So we know about megalithic, we know about sites such as Stonehenge, uh, and clearly these, these are sites which are characterised by these very large blocks. At the same time, many of the books that are ostensibly about megalithic monuments in reality range much more widely over a field that includes structures that are of dry stone construction, structures that are rock-cut, rock-cut tombs are often discussed alongside megalithic tombs, and that involve often earthen and timber elements, and often I think we forget the importance of timber in these monuments because timber disappears, leading, leaving only a, perhaps a small trace, whereas the megalithic blocks are much more obvious. So we need to, to think of all these monuments as interrelated. So when we talk here about megalithic in the context of the megalithic studies group, uh, I'm not excluding all these other types of monuments. And of course, we have classic megalithic monuments uh, like this menia at Camlui. Uh, we have monuments of earth, such as these henge monuments in Britain. And we have uh, timber monuments, and this is the timber burial chamber at Haddenham in eastern England. So it's not our intention to artificially separate megalithic monuments from any of the others. But at the same time, I wouldn't go so far as to suggest that the word megalithic is simply a convenient shorthand to cover all these classes of monuments, since that would imply that somehow the particular materiality of megalithic, the use of these large stone blocks, wasn't very important, and clearly it is important. Now, the Megalithic Studies Group takes its origin from discussions between myself and Christian Christiansen in 2003. And at that date, Christian and I agreed that an informal group holding occasional meetings would be a useful mechanism to bring together researchers from different countries. And this international dimension is very important. If you go back to early research. Well, obviously, we know that megalithic monuments are found in different countries of Western Europe, from uh, Scandinavia and Germany in the north, through Britain, Ireland, France, and down into Spain and Portugal. So a lot of different national traditions of research have built up around them. And if you go back into the history of research into these monuments, the earliest work tends to have been undertaken by antiquarians working within a national context, so studying the monuments of their own country, their own region. For instance, John Aubrey at the bottom here, who drew the first map of Avebury, 
And then, of course, in Scandinavia, we have people like Ole Wurm, if I pronounce it correctly, uh, in about the same period, talking about Danish monuments. And it was only really in the 19th century that researchers began to discuss more widely about how these various national groups of monuments, in fact, formed uh, a West European phenomenon, spread much more widely. And this comes about through studies such as the famous Baron de Bonstetten's Essay sur les Dolmen of 1865, and James Ferguson here wrote a book, uh, Rude Stone Monuments, in 1872. So for the following uh, 70 or 80 years, at least, it was recognised that there are connections between the monuments of different regions. But in the 1960s and 1970s, the rise, at least in Britain, and uh, of course in North America too, of what we call the new archaeology, or processual archaeology, uh, led to people uh, such as Colin Renfrew here, suggesting that perhaps we should be looking for independent origins. We should be looking for multiple origins. That's to say that uh, we should be studying different regional traditions. In a way, it almost goes back to where we were in the 17th century, in the sense that we're looking much more specifically at regional sequences, uh, and not uh, automatically regarding the whole of the Atlantic megalithic phenomenon as a single interrelated thing. Now, I think since then, the pendulum, since the 1970s, and certainly in the last 20 or 30 years, the pendulum has swung away from that position. And we now, once again, accept that interregional connections are indeed very important. And uh, without that, uh, we are not going to get a full understanding. So regional sequences are important, but there are clearly connections. And that is the purpose, really, of bringing people together in this kind of meeting to discuss... Uh, interregionally, what research, uh, recent research on certain aspects of these monuments uh, can, we can tell each other about, as it were. And that was the background against which the first meeting of the European Megalithic Studies Group was held in 2004 in Göteborg, in Sweden. Uh, the meeting was jointly organised with Carl Jöran Schören and me, and took the form of a series of papers uh, these were the speakers, and some of those speakers uh, I'm pleased to see are with us again today. Uh, these were the speakers at that first conference, uh, and we had a series of, of uh, papers, followed by uh, a field visit to the megalithic monuments of Vesterjutland, uh, the Carlaby monuments, and here you see uh, some people you may recognise visiting monuments in that area. And here again... And during the course of that meeting, we discussed the possible uh, venue and possible themes for a second meeting. And that second meeting eventually took place in Seville in 2008, uh, organised by Leonardo Garcia San Juan, who, again, I'm very pleased is with us today. Uh, the format here was very similar to that of the Yerteborg meeting. We had two days of workshop papers and discussion combined with field visits. So here we are in our... Uh, conference hall and uh, these are the two themes that we studied in that particular meeting and you see the speakers as well so we looked at different kinds of exotic materials um, both in the megalithic blocks themselves and in terms of objects in the tombs and we looked at questions of chronology and again, we had the two days of, of meetings, of, of papers, followed by um, a day of an excursion. Um, and in fact, Seville was an excellent venue for North Europeans since we had the meeting in November. And of course, uh, southern Spain in November is considerably uh, warmer than northern Europe. So it was a nice opportunity to get away to visit some of these great monuments, uh, Valencia de la Concepcion, for example, and uh, the Antequera monuments. Um, sorry, wrong way. Um, so here we are, that's Menga at Antiquera. Uh, we did have a, a short burst of rain even then, but uh, anyway. And there we all are standing at, uh, that's I think is Dolmen de la Pastora. Now the third meeting, we thought it might be a good idea to try and move back to Northern Europe. And so I was delighted when it became possible to hold the third meeting in Kiel, in Germany. And this was organised by German colleagues uh, Friedrich Lütt of the Römisch-Germanische Commission, 
um, and uh, Dr. Mart uh, and um, Professor Johannes Müller from uh, the University at Kiel, and uh, with uh, help from Dr. Martin Furholt, who took in hand many of the practical arrangements. And once again, we had. Uh, so here is the, the poster for that meeting in Kiel in 2010. And again, we had a series of themes and a series of speakers. And we followed these two days of um, papers. There is the whole group from uh, 2010 in Kiel. And the two, pa two uh, days of papers were followed again by a field visit to monuments uh, in the area of uh, the Baltic coast, just to the east of Kiel, including an excellent afternoon tea and coffee stop at Hovacht, which is very pleasant. And uh, the proceedings of the Kiel meeting, and indeed, oh yes, here we are, I should say, here is the excursion uh, from Kiel. The weather was slightly less uh, kind than it had been in uh, Seville, but uh, here we are looking at monuments in that area to the east of Kiel, near the Baltic coast. Yes, I was going to say that, in fact, now I'm very pleased that the proceedings of two of the previous meetings have recently been published, and that's to say the meeting at uh, Seville, which has been published here in this, uh, in this uh, monograph, and uh, the meeting at Kiel has also been published very recently, within the last year. So two of those have been published. So this brief account of the previous activities of the European Megalithic Studies Group brings us to today uh, and, of course, this fourth meeting. Of all areas of megalithic monuments in Western Europe, Brittany is arguably the most famous. Uh, no account of megalithic monuments could possibly be complete without reference to the Karnak alignments, uh, the Grand Minier Brise and the Tumulus de Saint-Michel, not to mention the equally important monuments of northern and western Brittany, and of adjacent regions such as Normandy or the area south of the Loire. And as in previous meetings of the group, I should say I've had only a marginal role in the practical arrangements, which have been handled virtually in their entirety by Luc Laporte, aided by Florian Cousseau. Uh, and I'm sure you will join with me in thanking Luc and Florian for bringing us together in Rennes and for making this event happen. And with the programme of papers and the excursion that they've organised, I'm sure we're all looking forward to an excellent few days.